Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels, winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? With you, um, I have the privilege of kicking off our Advent preaching series where uh, we'll be taking uh, three messages uh, to look at Hebrews uh, chapters 1 and 2, undoubtedly two real high points, uh, high points of scripture. And our messages, uh, we hope, will get uh, more Christmassy as we go along. So I said we are kicking off our Advent series uh, rather than saying that we are kicking off our Christmas series. Uh, that's very much because uh, Christmas is a time of uh, celebration, a time of joy, and actually release as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, uh, the Savior of the world. Advent, however, is the time that uh, precedes Christmas, that runs up to Christmas, and that time in biblical history is really very much marked by uh, a longing, a yearning for Jesus to come. Uh, meaning that if Christmas is the, the popping of the, the champagne bottle, Advent is very much the, the stirring up of that bottle, uh, building tension for the new wine of Jesus to arrive. Uh, the old hymn puts it like this, O come, O come Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. And you may yourself relate to that kind of longing. Maybe you're in a season of life where uh, you are longing for Jesus to be Emmanuel, God with us, as we've just read. Uh, perhaps you're uh, bursting for him to kind of break through and, and show up in your life. Well, take heart if this is you, uh, because the book of Hebrews is written to people such as yourself, uh, people under pressure struggling to navigate a culture hostile to Christianity. Or, or perhaps you're the, the other camp. Perhaps you think, well, I don't really feel like I need Jesus, much less long for him. Well, it, it's kind of like if you're used to sort of drinking bottles of Lambrini as opposed to drinking a proper wine. <laughs> Hebrews 1 comes into your life to, to wean you off a, a wine costing £1.80 from your local Nisa and comes to uh, really it broaden your taste buds. That's what Hebrews 1 comes to do uh, this morning. Uh, the message to the, to the Hebrews is Jesus is better. Uh, don't go back to the inferior. Uh, be it your old life, be it the priesthood, which we'll get into, be it angels, be it the occult, be it Lambrini Bianco. <laughs> and one of the ways that Hebrews uh, tries to help us expand our palates is by explaining that Jesus is the divine and long-awaited prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is the long-awaited and divine prophet, priest, and king. But look, 
I wasn't born yesterday. I'm very aware that in our culture, uh, prophets are generally seen as wacky, uh, priests are generally seen as irrelevant, and kings are generally seen, in our context at least, as symbolic. So, who cares? Why, why even if Jesus is this kind of uber prophet, priest, king thing, what, what does that really matter? To which I'd say, uh, there's that Lambrini again. Uh, because by reintroducing you to these ancient concepts, uh, the writer to the Hebrews is actually uh, reintroducing you to, well, you. And to your original call as a human. He's reintroducing you to your ancestors and your ancient ancestors, right back to the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve in the garden. Because on the very first page of the Bible, God would call humanity to be all of these things, with God creating humanity to be kings and priests on the earth. We were called to be kings with Genesis 1, chapter 28, saying, verse 28, saying, uh, God calling humanity to subdue the earth, to fill it, and to have dominion. These are all kind of kingly commands. Uh, God would choose to rule the world through humanity created in his image, uh, giving us great authority to, to govern, to steward, to administer, to rule. Uh, we were called to be kings. But we were also called to be priests, in that we were called to have access to God. Uh, we see this in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, even in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, we, humanity, were called to minister God to creation. We were, we were called to even represent creation uh, before God. We were called to be priests. But we were also called to be prophets in that it was given to us to reveal what God is like and who he is and speak for him and on his behalf as his ambassadors. We were called to be prophets. Meaning that since the very beginning, prophet, priest, king have been sacred callings woven deep, deep into the foundation of what it means to be human. Uh, being as foundational to the human experience as trees, with them all being created, again, on the first page of the Bible. Meaning that to, to ignore prophet, priest, and king is to kind of be as irresponsible as disregarding the importance of trees from our human experience. To, to regard these things as irrelevant is to be irreverent to him who created us. All this to say that God created you in your mother's womb with these three purposes in mind. Prophet, priest, and king. But, and there is a but. Have you ever kind of looked in the mirror and kind of stared intently at your, your own eyes for a period of time? If we're being honest, we struggle to see such a, a high call on us from God. We do. Why is that? Well, if I might be so bold, it's because we feel guilty. It's because we feel ashamed. We, we know that we've sinned before God. You know, I know we've sinned. Uh, just like our first parents in the garden, Adam and Eve. And it was their sin that caused this virus of sin to, to, to spread to everybody and every living thing. And as the, the pages of the Old Testament, the, the, the first half, if you like, of the Bible would progress, we really see God's response to this first sin that caused all of humanity to fall from this original kind of call and mandate. God would, would, would respond by... Uh, 
choosing a people on the earth who would act as something of a vehicle to bless all the peoples of the earth. God would start by choosing a man named Abraham. And, and decide to work through his family line, which would later be known as Israel. He would, he would as history would progress, usher in a new era, uh, bringing forward these, this threefold call from the background to the foreground, with prophet, priest, and king and being established in the Old Testament period as unique offices or unique divisions. God would call some to be uh, full-time prophets, uh, giving them authority to speak uh, to the nation, to nations, and to key leaders. God would call some to be full-time priests, giving them authority to make sacrifices on behalf of the nation. God will call some to be full-time kings, tasked with leading the nation as a shepherd would lead sheep. Problem is, with the prophets, many or some of whom wrote the Old Testament of the Bible, when you read the accounts of their lives, though heroic, they sinned. And some in really, really big ways. The trouble with the priests was that they were exhausted. They were knackered. They never got the chance to, to sit down. Uh, they were constantly having to offer sacrifices for their own sin, let alone the sin of the nation. And the trouble with the kings was, well, for the most part, they are off on their own agendas. Uh, meaning that this, this era, this time, where God would uh, bring prophet, priest, and king to the fore and employ this full-time Old Testament personnel was not to... <sighs> It was not to solve the problem. If anything, it was to, to create a longing and to cause us to desire the one who would come and solve the problem. For us to desire the one who would be the perfect prophet, the perfect priest, and the perfect king, leading us to this time of Advent, the season where we, we long for Jesus to come. And with that as a background, Hebrews chapter 1 can now come in. And this is what it says in Hebrews 1. It says, long ago, this long ago is referring to the Old Testament period we've just been discussing, from the creation of the world to about three, four, five hundred years before Jesus would come out to the earth. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Uh, what this is getting at is uh, through the period of the Old Testament, God would um, uh, speak through the, 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 the words of prophets, um, revealing who he is and what he was seeking and, and predicting future events. And this was good. But this whole period was all really in, t in anticipation, not for another prophet to come, but for the ultimate prophet to come. It was all in anticipation for, for Jesus himself to come. And Jesus, he would come. And he would come not to cancel all that went before, but he would come to confirm it. Uh, Jesus comes as the climax. Jesus comes as the crescendo. Jesus comes as the culmination to centuries of prior revelation. Jesus comes to us as the perfect prophet with it saying this, that Jesus is the exact imprint of his nature. The exact imprint. Meaning that while humanity was given authority to speak through being made in the image of God, Jesus Christ speaks with the greatest authority because he is the image of God. Jesus was never made in the image. He is the image. He is the imprint, as we read, of God's nature. Uh, Jesus speaks the words of God as the word of God. What Jesus utters, God utters. What Jesus speaks, God speaks. If Jesus coughs, God coughs. Jesus 
is the perfect prophet. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. This means that Jesus is the final and definitive revelation of God the Father, the prophet we need. But that's not to say that we don't have in our uh, kind of society other prophets, and they're not all bad at all. I mean, we, we seek out prophets or prophecy uh, with, with regards to uh, house prices, with regards to the, the FTSE, with regards to whether Bitcoin's going to go up or down, Ethereum, etc., etc. Uh, some people will even turn to the forces of darkness and wickedness by seeking out the occult, horoscopes, tarot, psychics. Uh, we can even turn uh, prophets ourselves um, through uh, betting, for example, gambling. My personal favourite through fantasy football. Not that I'm any good at it. Um, Matt Carvel came like second in the world, by the way, just uh, to let you know. In fantasy football, no one cares anymore because it was last season. Um, uh, moving on. <laughs> I didn't plan to say that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and so that's not to say all of these things are, are bad. Some, some of them are bad, but not all of them. The point I make is that prophets and prophecy isn't as wacky as it sounds. Actually, we seek them out in our day-to-day -day lives. It's worth saying this, though. Jesus is a prophet like no other, because the word Jesus speaks creates stuff. It says, through Jesus, he created the world. Later on in Hebrews chapter 1, it doubles down on saying that it was Jesus that created the world. Jesus that created everything. With it saying, in reference to Jesus, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth from the beginning. When God wanted to create the universe, he gave the task to Jesus, his son. With Jesus not only being the last word from God, but the first words from God in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, let there be light. Meaning that Jesus is not only the, what well, meaning that Jesus is the word of God that, that spoke everything into existence. And in the same way, Jesus is the word of God who sustains everything in existence. Jesus, it says, upholds the universe by the word of his power, or he upholds the universe by his powerful word. That means right now it is Jesus himself through, through his word that is upholding the, the molecules and the particles in you that makes you you. It is by his word that I am able to finish these words. Jesus, therefore, is able to speak for God like no human or heavenly being in history. Jesus is the perfect prophet. But Jesus isn't just the perfect prophet, because he comes to us as the perfect priest. It says this, after making purification for sins. Purification. The, the, the trouble with sin is that a sin stains us before God. And though, of course, we can't see these kind of mysterious sins, we can certainly feel them. It's that feeling of guilt that we experience when we do something dishonorable. It's that feeling of shame that we experience when we are compromised or we compromise our own selves. And you can't really prove it by science. It's not something that you can sort of measure in a test tube, guilt and shame. But the experience is just as real as the stains that they point to. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like if you're doing some DIY and you're doing some hammering and you hammer your thumb. And of course, it's, it's painful, right? Everybody knows that that pain is working as something of an alarm to tell you something is, is urgently, desperately wrong. Well, guilt and shame, they do the same work. They're sort of kind of like an alarm that's telling us that we've injured ourselves. We've, we've, we've injured our humanity. We've, we've been contaminated. That's, that's what it is. And this is why we need the perfect priest to come and make purification for us from the inside. Uh, and in our culture, uh, we, see, we talk about priests, 
Uh, but generally we speaking, we see priests as kind of you know, dog collar wearing, robe wearing type folk. Not so much me, I grew up in the Church of England. I had a vicar, he was a very nice man. I'm quite pro, uh, dog collar and robe wearing. In fact, I think we should all come together and make the elders of this church <laughs> wear dog collars and robes full time, not just at church events, but in the swimming pool, in the gym, etc. <laughs> Um, in fact, I've actually taken it upon myself to produce some of the elders. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. I think if I did that, that would very much be the last preach I would ever <laughs> preach on this stage. <laughs> oh, so, so, I, so I'll take it or leave it, dog collar thing, I'm, I'm kind of kidding. But our culture isn't particularly big fan of that whole process. You know, they see priests as kind of celibate, uh, strange uh, people, and in the case, sadly, of a few uh, dangerous. But the reality is that priests, um, I'd go so far as to say, uh, they are more uh, culturally important uh, than ever. Uh, the reason I say that is, uh, you sin, you get caught up in uh, misfortune, you say something that you shouldn't, um, you fall from grace, uh, you call Oprah, uh, with Oprah assuming the uh, kind of role of great high priest of our generation. And though, it, um, kind of, although we're modern people and we're 21st century people, it actually works kind of like the Old Testament priesthood did that we've been discussing, uh, whereby the candidate uh, uh, comes up and there is a time of confession and they're looking for some forgiveness or uh, some, uh, some comfort, ultimately with a view to being absolved and being kind of allowed back into the society with a sort of a, a pat on the back. However, trouble is, you only get one shot with Oprah. You can't go back to her a second time. So what happens the next time you sin or you mess up and Ellen isn't available? Other versions of this in our culture would be uh, uh, YouTube apology videos. I don't know if you've seen any of this. And this is when a, a star uh, gets caught up in some, again, unpleasantness and releases a kind of a video to say sorry and, and seeking forgiveness, not from God, but from people who are being put in the place of priests. Although we are 21st century folk that don't really go to men with dog collars, truly we have no fewer priests amongst us. Mercifully, for those of us that can't afford a friendship with Oprah, uh, the Bible says that Jesus makes purification for our sins. With Jesus speaking from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, saying, Sacrifices and offerings I have not desired. Meaning that you don't need to make up to God. You don't need a priest to absolve you. You don't need to kind of... Uh, uh, kind of torture yourself or offer sacrifices. Why? Because Jesus Christ became the priest for you and he would offer himself as the sacrifice. Um, and while the Bible talks about the priests of old offering the blood of bulls and the blood of goats to uh, appease God for sin, uh, the Bible also says that this blood never did anything really. Uh, but Jesus doesn't come offering the blood of bulls or the blood of goats. He comes offering himself. He is the perfect sacrifice, and he would become, through faith, your advocate, which means that he is your champion. He is the one that prays for you. He is the one that speaks up for you. Jesus is the greater Oprah. Therefore, you can come to Jesus as you are, stained as you are, and receive purification. You don't have to clean yourself up. In fact, you must not must not clean yourself up because it is Jesus and him only that is able to purify you and he will purify and cleanse you from the inside out. Jesus is the perfect priest. And lastly, we see Jesus as the perfect king. This is what it says. After making purification for sins, he sat down. He sat down. Now, as we've discussed, aside from the fact that Old Testament priests really never got an opportunity to sit down, uh, when it talks about sitting down here in Hebrews, it's as much talking about the posture of a king as anyone else. 
as anything else. And, and while we've already discussed and looked at our culture, uh, where we see the prophets in our culture, where we see priests in our culture, uh, time would fail me to talk about the, the kings in our culture, the, the things that we kind of are governed and led by, the things that, and people that we follow. But Jesus would be a king different from all those other kings. The Bible would call Jesus the king above all kings. Uh, Jesus would begin as the king at Christmas who came down, and Jesus would finish as the king who sat down. With Jesus sitting in the seat of most honor, at the right hand of the majesty on high, we read. And the passage gives two reasons why Jesus is the king. Uh, The first reason is this, because Jesus created everything. He is the creator owner. Jesus is the holder of creation's patent. Uh, But the second reason that uh, the Bible gives is uh, kind of, I suppose, a bit more unusual. It says that Jesus is the king because he is bestowed it. He is given it. He, He inherits it. He is the heir to it. Jesus would begin, excuse me, that means that Jesus is the owner of all things because he created But he's the heir of all things because he incarnated. He became a man. Jesus inherits all that he already owns. A few weeks ago, I took a walk with a friend from this church. And he asked this question. Perhaps it's a question that's on your mind. He said, why on earth would Jesus inherit all that he already owns? is owner of? And it's a good question, right? It's like, is Jesus the king or not? If he's the king, you know, if you're king, you don't, in, you don't need to inherit stuff because you own everything. And I'll answer that question by, by saying this. If Jesus never came at Christmas, he'd still be the king. He created everything. But if Jesus never came, where would you be? No, Jesus, Jesus came for you. Jesus came to inherit you. The difference between Jesus being the owner creator and Jesus being the inheritor is you. If you're a Christian, you are the inheritance of God. Jesus sees you as his prize, the reward of his labor, the crown of his inheritance. And just as a a high-ranking military official is bestowed with yet another medal to, to mark his service with distinction, you are that medal placed on Jesus' lapel by God the Father. And you know he wears you with pride. The Bible says at the end of time he will confess your name to the Father and before the holy angels. He can't stop talking about you. And if that wasn't good enough, it gets better because Jesus didn't just come to inherit you. He came to inherit with you. With Jesus giving up his sole beneficiary status so that he could share it all with you. And he doesn't rent it to you, dear friend. No, he he puts your name on the deed. He hands you a set of keys. He would even restore you back to your original call and then some with Peter, one of Jesus' best friends, calling Christians a chosen race a royal priesthood, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. A royal priesthood, through faith in Jesus, restored to a king and a priest once again, so that as a prophet, you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. And in this time of Advent, anything less, dear friends, than a longing for Jesus and all he, all he might be to us, anything less than yearning for this, is simply just Lambrini. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for the wonder of him. We thank you that he would come for us at Christmas. We thank you that he is truly the the great prophet, priest, and king. And Lord, we we confess our need for (laughs) Jesus as prophet, priest, and king today. And Lord Jesus, we do ask for you to come and be all these things to us. Lord, would you lead us as king? Lord, would you speak to us as prophet? Would you purify us and forgive us as priest? We need all of you, Jesus, (laughs) and we long for you. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. Let's stand together. What a saviour we have in Jesus. What a saviour. He has come to us. Jesus coming at Christmas, we celebrate at Christmas. It's not just nice. It's not festive. It's everything. 